Good evening and welcome to this special joint meeting of the Northampton City Council and School Committee uh, called by uh, Mayor David Jane Arkowitz in accordance with Northampton Charter Section 7-2 Annual Budget Policy. Uh, I will begin by asking the clerk to call the roll of the School Committee and the City Council. Mr. Jesse Adams? Here. Ms. Maureen Carney? Present. Mr. Bill White? Here. Ms. Elisa Klein? Here. Ms. Marianne Labarge? Present. Mr. David Murphy? Here. Mr. Ryan O'Donnell? Here. Ms. Gina Louise Yara? Here. Mr. Paul Spector? Here. Ms. Blue Duvall? Ms. Laura Fallon? Here. Ms. Pam Hanna? Ms. Ann Hennessy? Present. Mr. Downey Meyer? Present. Ms. Lisa Minnick? Here. Mr. Howard Moore? Here. Ms. Carrie Naporchuk? Here. Mr. Edward Zahowski? Present. And Mayor David Arquette? You're here. Present. Yes. <laughs> um, excellent. So we have a certain have a quorum of joint uh, meeting. So council, I also wanted to note that Superintendent Provost is with us tonight, as well as the School Business Administrator, Candy Walzak, and Susan Wright. Um, the school, uh, the city finance director is here, and also a member of the board of trustees of Smith Vocational, uh, Jack Cotton, is here as well tonight. So I just wanted to acknowledge those other officials that are with us. Um, so tonight I wanted to just take us through um, a few slides, to try to pare it down from past years, uh, so I don't over, overwhelm you with PowerPoint. Um, but the purpose really is to just look at some of the trends, look at some of the issues that we've been working on over the last uh, several budget years, and talk about um, what we're looking at in terms of uh, revenues, expenditures for 2016, what some of the challenges are, and then lay out the process. The Charter intends this meeting to be sort of a kickoff of the uh, city budget process by bringing these two bodies together um, uh, to, to have this uh, to have this briefing. So the first slide um, actually going to start with some of the community community indicators that we've looked at in the past. Um, the first slide is just taking a look at what's the what's the um, what's the single family uh, average an average single family home value uh, in the last in, in this FY 2015 tax year. The state average uh, 368,359. You can see the spread uh, across some of our neighboring communities. Uh, Northampton falling at 30078. That's uh, that's sort of where we fall in the spectrum. In terms of our residential tax rate for this current uh, FY 2015, um, you'll see that Northampton uh, across that spectrum we're at fifteen dollars and eighty cents per thousand, and you can sort of see the range. Uh, uh, of, of other communities where they fall. Um, the $20, uh, $20 threshold um, is actually somewhat significant. There's only 18 communities in the state that um, are above $20 in their, uh, and, and we have four of them here, and actually Longmeadow has the highest residential tax uh, rate in Massachusetts. So uh, they have that honor. Holyoke this year has the highest commercial tax rate in the Commonwealth. They have been number three, um, and they've uh, passed Everett uh, to take the number one spot. So uh, that just gives you a sense. Um, in terms of looking at a list of 361 communities, I think our tax rate falls at like number 211. Um, so we're, we're uh, you know, in that spectrum, sort of lower, lower half of, of the list. This is what the average single family tax bill uh, in for FY 2015. The state average, $5,231. You can see Northampton uh, is below that, $4,757. Um, and then you can again see the range of communities uh, on either side of us here in the valley. This is, a, this is sort of an interesting one. This is the free cash balance. Um, this is our, this is actually the city of Northampton's free cash balance over the last 10 years. You're going to see a lot of 10 year snapshots. Um, this, uh, this sort of shows you the, um, the, the ride we've been on over the last 10 years. We just got our free cash certified in the last couple of weeks. Um, but you can see that the undesignated fund balance, which we aim to have in the range of three to 5% is what DOR recommends. Um, you can see when we had the, uh, the collapse uh, and the mid-year budget cuts in FY09 uh, and 
2010, we actually had a negative uh, undesignated fund balance at the end of the year, um, which several other communities were in that same situation. So again, just broadening out to our comparison with neighboring communities, this is looking at our free cash balances over the last three years, and you can sort of see um, how Northampton uh, compares relative to our neighbors, uh, again, um, you know, Agawam at one end over to Ludlow. Um, looking at um, our combined general fund reserves for the city of Northampton, this is a combination of our stabilization, our capital stabilization, and then the fiscal, sustain uh, fiscal stabilization fund that we created uh, two years ago. You can see um, how, those have, have, uh, how, how those have played out, again, over a 10-year period. You can see again in FY09, FY10, FY11, when we had to rely on our stabilization funds uh, to be able to stave off deep cuts in state aid, uh, they, they were drained significantly. And over the last three fiscal years, you can see that we made a commitment to, to rebuilding those, um, to getting them uh, back up to where they should be. They're not quite in the range that we'd like them, um, but, uh, but we're, we're making an effort. You can see right now we're at five, our combined um, stabilization funds as a percentage of our general fund budgets, about 5.4%. Um, and that's sort of the highest it's been in, in a 10 year period. So we're, we're um, trying to get those rebuilt. Looking at neighboring communities, again, um, their, their stabilization funds as a percentage of their total budgets you can see that Northampton um, is trying to get up to 5%. Only two of our neighbors, West Springfield and Amherst, are at or above that 5% mark. And then you can sort of see where the other, um, you know, where the other communities are. Um, we usually go over this every year, but I, and I'll repeat it again, why reserves matter. Obviously, it gives us the flexibility to respond to emergency situations, i.e., FY 2009. Um, it's very important for our bond rating. When we have uh, rating calls with uh, Standard & Poor's or Moody's, um, they want to see that we have a healthy reserve position uh, when it comes time to determining what our bond rating is, which then in turn affects um, how, uh, how we're able to borrow on the bond market and what kinds of interest rates we get. Um, so you can see uh, you know, our ratings right now are AA2, um, and, uh, and they've highlighted some of our strengths, including a diverse tax base, a trend of increasing reserve levels, Moody's highlighted. They also highlighted the recent approval of the Proposition 2.5 override uh, when, they, when they upgraded us to that AA2 rating. Um, uh, they also gave us advice about what could make the ratings go up, including continued improvement in our financial uh, position, uh, sizable fund balance growth, and then of course they say what could make the rating go down, and you can see again decrease in the tax base or decline in our reserve or liquidity position. We are going to be having to go out to bond this spring, um, which means we'll be having a, a rating call with our, with our bond uh, folks. Um, so these things are very important uh, as we start to compile all the projects we've done in our capital program and bundle them to go out to bond. So this is our general fund. Um, these, these are the revenue sources that we built our FY 2015 budget on. Um, you can see that the largest share of, um, of that is, uh, is tax revenue. Um, uh, that includes largely property tax as well as some of the other uh, taxes. Um, state revenues comes in second. That's at 19.3%. Those are our things like Chapter 70 and our unrestricted local aid. Um, and then you've got the other categories uh, that, that break down in that pie chart. This is just a different way to look at it that kind of lists some of the things that go into taxes, for example, excise, real estate, personal property, et cetera. Um, and then it shows you all the other, uh, all the other various revenue sources that go into building the budget. Obviously, though, the lion's share of it is taxes, local taxes. This is new growth. This is a really important um, number because it's one of the one of the few ways that we're able to um, expand our tax levy above the two and a half percent that we're that we're mandated to stay at. Um, so this represents, um, in a given year, 
uh, new uh, taxable uh, properties that come online during that fiscal year, and we're allowed to actually add that onto our levy as part of the tax levy calculation. You can see that we've had excellent, uh, uh, the last two years have been excellent in terms of new growth, um, 716 in, in 2014, uh, 916 um, in 2015, which again is the highest uh, new growth we've experienced in 10 years. Again, those are the projects like the ones we've seen on King Street, Village Hill, uh, the new hotel on Con Street. All of these new, new uh, properties coming onto the tax rolls represents new growth. And again, that's, uh, that's very helpful to us because it helps us uh, generate additional revenue um, as we build the budget. Uncollected taxes, uh, again, just to show you, we continue the trend of, of having a very low percentage of uncollected taxes. Uh, that's not a major issue in terms of our uh, revenue picture. Um, net state aid, uh, this is one that, that I show you. We kind of expanded it longer than 10 years because I think it's interesting to just see the history. Um, net state aid, so this represents um, uh, net state aid, meaning our, our um, unrestricted local aid, Chapter 70, uh, minus other on offsets like our MSBA payments. You can see that where we are right now in 2015, uh, 9,813,000. Um, not much higher than we were in 2014 or 2013. It's been largely flat. Um, there was a big uh, drop in FY 2012, but it's important to look where we were in FY 2002. We were getting over $13 million in state aid. And so that really shows you um, how much we've lost in state aid over the last 10 to 12 years. And I know we've done charts in the past which say, you know, if we've been level funded, even just level funded, beginning in 2009, that would have represented a significant amount of, uh, of funding. Um, so that's our state aid picture. Um, this shows you just focusing on unrestricted local aid uh, that, that comes to the city. It used to be a combination of lottery and additional assistance. Then it got blended into this unrestricted governmental aid, a general governmental aid. Again, you can see the last three years, there's been very little growth. Um, it's, uh, you know, We've been projecting, you know, one percent increase, and feeling that that's maybe optimistic. Um, so we'll have to see. Uh, the, um, the governor has obviously got a, a, a deficit now that he has to close. I'm told he's going to be announcing um, a list tomorrow, possibly as early as tomorrow, what he's going to have to cut to close that gap. He said he's not going to touch local aid. He's going to leave that alone. Um, but it has raised concerns about what local aid in Chapter 7 might look like in his FY16 budget. Uh, he's, as a candidate, um, he's been, he was very strong about uh, not only preserving local aid, but giving us increases that were commensurate with increases in state revenue. Um, but obviously, uh, I'm not sure what the deficit situation, how that will affect what he does in terms of state aid for 2016. This is Chapter 70. This is the school aid. Um, again, uh, very flat. We've been a minimum aid community, uh, which means we generally get uh, every year $25 per pupil increase has sort of been the minimum that we receive. And, it's, and there's a lot of communities that are in that same grouping. Um, those of you who um, attended the foundation review uh, budget hearing, there was a lot of discussion about the foundation budget on which uh, Chapter 70 is based. Um, and concerns about its, uh, its relevance, its age, uh, whether it truly reflects all of the costs of, of educating students. But, uh, but that kind of shows you um, where we've been in Chapter 70, which explains, again, a lot of the pressure that we've had on our city budget, particularly schools. This is hotel motel tax. Um, uh, it just sort of shows you uh, where we've come over the last 10 years. Obviously, we added to that. Um, the meals tax was new in 2010. Um, it's been somewhat uh, stable to flat over the last several years. We don't see any, any major um, changes in that. I should tell you 2015 is an estimate. That's not actual. That was the estimate we used, so we don't know where that's going to close. You can see that it's been a, a good source of revenue, um, but it's been fairly fairly flat the last uh, few years. This is the interfund operating transfers from the enterprise funds. Uh, and again, um, 
for those on the city council who went through the, dis the policy discussion that we had about creating a new enterprise fund, there was a lot of discussion about indirect charges um, that the enterprise funds pay back <coughs> to the general fund. Um, I show this slide because it shows that um, even with the addition of a uh, fourth enterprise fund, after we reworked all of the indirects and, and uh, went through all of those indirect charges and made modifications, we're receiving less uh, in 2015 than, than we've received in the last 10 years from the enterprise fund. So that just shows you one of our other revenue sources coming to us from the enterprise funds. These are expenditures. Um, this gives you the ratio of the expenditures in the current budget. Um, and it uh, goes right across uh, the board. It's actually easier to see it on the next, well, I'll say that, but it's really small. Uh, okay. Education, 38.68%. Employee benefits, almost 20%. Uh, then it goes down to public safety at almost 15%. Um, debt service, 6.6. Uh, .6, general government, 5% public works 3% and then a number of, um, of other uh, smaller um, uh, charges. So I, I always give this little extra presentation when we're here together because um, while it shows what our school expenditures are, when we factor in things like the employee benefits that we pay for the schools, when we factor in uh, a number of other charges that are paid for on the city side, um, and that there's a whole indirect reporting process that goes on. Um, expenditures for education actually equal about 55.4% of the total budget um, when, you, when you factor all those things in. So, um, so just like to always fill that in because the actual appropriation budget doesn't include the indirects and some of the other things that go into education. And obviously health insurance is one of the major ones as well. Just quickly, could you say, was the other one 38? Just to look at, it was yes. 55 here, is the uh, other 38? Yes. Okay, yeah. thank you. Exactly. That's good. Thank you. Um, okay, this is the general fund appropriation for education. Uh, this is what the, uh, what, what the city appropriates to NPS and to Smith, uh, Smith School each year. Um, and you can see, again, uh, there, it was very flat uh, over the last uh, you know, several, you know, 2008, 2009 through there. Um, we did make significant uh, investments in the education side, raising the appropriation in the last two fiscal years. Again, largely as a result of the override. Um, you can see that in 2014, which was the override year, uh, it actually represented a 6% increase uh, in appropriation of education as we were again trying to um, restore some of the uh, services that had been lost over the last several over the prior fiscal years as well as preserve uh, the services that were in place this is uh, this is the this is another slide that we talk about every year and we've done some variations on it because we've gotten a lot of questions about it over time. This is school choice and charter school sending tuition, net of charter school reimbursement. So this is just what we are sending out in school choice and charter school sending tuition, minus the reimbursement that we get for, for charter school uh, reimbursement. And you can see, again, over the last 10 years, that's been a constantly, um, constantly rising number. Uh, getting close to 2.5 million <coughs> in the current fiscal year. We've often been asked, well, don't you get, you also take in school choice students, so, so you also have to offset that. So what, how does the math work with that? So this is just a quick, for 2015, a quick little uh, primer on that. We have 201 students who leave our district uh, for charter school. Um, they, we send out in tuition uh, two, a little over $2.3 million. Uh, the next two numbers, those two eight numbers, are what we get back in reimbursement from the state. Um, so then the char charter school tuition minus reimbursement is, uh, again, 1.8 million. Then we have 68 uh, students who are leaving the district for choice. Um, we're sending with them $432,243. Uh, $432, um, so total charter and choice, 269, or that total 2.3 million that was on the previous slide. Then the incoming students were taking in 220 students in school choice. Um, and we are receiving in tuition 1.4 million. So at the end of the day, the, the final equation is 
Um, we have 49 less kids in our district. We have 920,721 less dollars. Um, and here's a here's sort of a, another way to look at it um, over time, showing you how that's played out over time. Um, uh, you know, again, showing you that net net gain or loss from Northampton in dollars, and then in red is actually showing you the net gain and net loss in students. Um, again, that's factoring in both charter choice and then also what we've taken in choice dollars. This was an issue that I talked about at the recent um, at the recent foundation budget in my testimony, um, uh, because again, if you look at the what we what we um, pay. Charter schools, on average, we're sending them about 9,400 on average in tuition, whereas our, our choice students were, were sending about uh, 6,000. It's about a $3,000 difference, and that includes some SPED uh, costs as well. So there's a major disparity in um, the tuition, sending tuition for charter versus school choice. The ed experts will tell you, well, there's a reason for that, and there's a there's a reason because you know that choice seat was going to be empty anyway, and so you really should don't have to do that. Um, you, you know you're, you're not losing any money by by that seat or filling that seat. But when you really look at how they come up with the charter, particularly the charter uh, tuition, where they take the foundation budget and then they add a whole lot of extra stuff, including the overrides that we pass here locally ostensibly to compete with the charter schools and to try to maintain competitiveness with the charter schools, they get a cut of our override as well. It's built into charter school tuition and sent to them. Um, so, so I think that's an issue that a lot of people highlighted. And it's, again, it's, it's an important driver in our budget because we happen to be a school district that um, has a number of charters around us. And so this, this is going to be a constant pressure on our budget. So. Um, health insurance. This has also been one of the, if not one of the biggest drivers of our budget over the last 10 years. Um, you can see the sharp increases beginning in 2005, um, you know, crossing up, you know, approaching $10 million as we got into 11 and 12. Um, we we uh, moved into the GIC uh, on January 1st of last year, the Group Insurance Commission. Um, you can see in 2014 and 2015, we kind of we saved. We went down slightly and have, and have stabilized. Um, but that is going to be one of the big concerns uh, coming into this fiscal year, because among the items that are part of the deficit that Governor Baker has inherited are some structural funding issues relative to the Insurance Commission um, that, that they are going to have to address, combined with some um, some of the plans in the eastern part of the state which are coming in with potentially much higher premiums this year. So that may be, and I'll highlight it later, that may be one of the issues that puts additional pressure on our budget as a GIC community. I was supposed to go to a meeting on Tuesday of all the GIC communities meeting with the head of the GIC. Um, obviously the snow uh, canceled that. That meeting's taking place tomorrow. The GIC has a hearing next month and then has to vote on its rates, uh, has to vote on its final rates in March. So that's going to be a significant number for us to look at in terms of, um, you know, in terms of effect on our budget. This is our retirement assessment. Um, we, uh, we had the, the retirement board, the Northampton Retirement Board. Um, adopted new mortality tables in FY16. They have to do that, I think, every, is it every two years or every, I think it's, every, we have to recalibrate them. So, um, so we are going to experience a significant uptick in terms of what we are required uh, to pay uh, to our retirement system this year um, because of that uh, recalibration of the rates. So that's going to be one of the issues uh, that we'll be looking at as we put together the budget for 2016. The fiscal stability plan. This is just a quick overview um, uh, of the plan that we put together uh, when we went out to the voters asking for the override in 2013. Obviously, we were asking for a $2.5 million operating override. Um, but the pledge to the voters at that time was we would use some of that $2.5 million to 
deal with the, the issues we were having in that current budget for 2014 to, again, maintain services on both the school side and the city side, but then we would create a fiscal stability stabilization fund and we'd set aside um, some, of that, some of that new revenue in that fund. Um, and, the, and the plan that we laid out in, the, in that original year, you can see in 2014, um, we would, that, we would, that first year we used 1.7 of the override, we put 773 plus into the fiscal stability fund. And then we've contributed again, not used all the revenues from the override and continue to put revenue into that stability fund. The idea, the plan at the time was that when we got past to 2016, we could get through 2016. Then in 2017, the blue, we would draw down from that fund uh, to help support that budget in 2017. But in 2018, um, we would find ourselves uh, in the red, as it were, uh, once that fund had been, had been uh, used up. Last year for the 2015 budget, um, we, we uh, and again, the commitment I made at the time was that we would look at it every year. We would reassess it every year. Um, we would work to try to find savings in the budget. We would obviously continue our efforts to lobby for more revenue. Um, we would obviously try to support new growth. Um, all of those things, and that each year we would recalibrate and take a look at it. So in FY 2015 budget, um, we, uh, we actually um, increased what had been our projected deposit into that uh, stability fund for, for 2015, and we created sort of a new glide path um, that we believe would allow us to get out into part of 2020. You can see that um, we were able to start drawing on it in 2018, a small portion of it, again, another portion of it in 2019. In 2020, the fund would be depleted and we'd still have a small deficit that we'd have to address in that fiscal year. So that's where we are in the current fiscal year. Um, obviously, as we build the budget for 2016, uh, we'll be looking at some of, the, some of the issues and challenges that I highlighted on the revenue side, um, state aid is still unknown as I uh, typically when we've had this meeting the last three years the governor would have already released his budget um, uh, last week um, sitting governors release their budget this third week in January so we would have had house one would have been introduced we would have had an idea of what the governor was proposing for local aid because governor Baker is new the rules allow him submit his budget so he doesn't he won't be submitting his budget he has a March 4th <laughs> deadline so that'll be really our first look at what what the administration uh, is going to do on local aid and then we have to wait and see what the um, you know what the what the House and the Senate do uh, I mentioned to you already that some of the um, some of the revenue sources that that we've relied on hotel motel uh, even parking and ambulance have been stable but they've maintained fairly flat over the last several years. Um, we will experience a decrease in our indirect revenue coming from the sewer enterprise fund. And again, that's part of the new methodology that, uh, that we worked on as part of looking at all of our indirect charges. There's also an interesting, it's, it's fitting that we're standing in JFK, um, there's also an interesting quirk to our payoff of the um, of the debt exclusion on JFK uh, the the JFK middle school was renovated uh, and in 20 years ago uh, 1995 I think is when uh, when we began paying down that 20-year debt exclusion and the way the old MSBA system worked because of the timing the reimbursement coming later like a year after the fact we're now at the end um, and so we actually will have to lower the levy limit temporarily uh, by this 456 763 and credit that to to the taxpayers and to the other debt excluded projects for this fiscal year um, what that means is we we have you know almost half a million dollar less revenue uh, in this particular fiscal year as a result of that quirk they've since changed that system um, MSBA doesn't work that way anymore. They don't make the community finance the entire 
the entire portion of the project and then reimburse them. They just have you reimburse, they just have you finance your portion of it. Um, and that's actually what we're doing uh, currently with the roof projects that we're doing through MSBA. So that's sort of a, another significant uh, uh, revenue issue that, that's factoring into the things that we're working on for the 2016 budget. Expenditures, again, I mentioned that retirement assessment. Um, we have a, a, what's essentially an 8.3% increase in our assessment this year, or 400,000. Uh, this, and the, again, it's based on the new mortality tables, and it's about 3% higher uh, than we had initially been projecting. <coughs> Health insurance, GIC rates are, antici are anticipated to increase above historic average increases. Um, we, uh, we put in as a as sort of an, a marker for this particular uh, fiscal year coming up, four percent increase in health insurance, um, which based on you know three to five year averages in the GIC was very conservative, um, but we're concerned. We don't know what you know. Hopefully, learn more tomorrow when I'm at this meeting. Uh, what what kind of rate increases we may be looking at. But it's significant, as, I, as we've said before, a 1% increase to the city is about $100,000, uh, you know, uh, to, our, to our budget in terms of expenditure. So um, a 1% uptick in the rates is significant. So we'll have to see how that is. Another, another um, expenditure issue is electric rates. Um, we have locked in our electric rates uh, through October, um, and then we have to go out to bid again. Um, and as many of you who are residential ratepayers know, uh, both of our utility companies um, instituted significant increases in, um, in, uh, in utility rates, particularly for electricity. So we are concerned that we'll be seeing, um, we'll be seeing similar kinds of increases. Um, interesting, we've spent the last five or six years trying to lower our energy costs and actually lowered them by 20%. Uh, as part of our sustainability initiatives, which I'm glad we did, and it's great, but obviously some of the concern we're hearing on the residential side is they're raising rates 20%. So we may, um, we may see a, a major uptick there as we go out to bid. Uh, capital program costs, obviously we've been trying to address all the many capital needs in the capital program, um, but there's a lot of needs in our schools uh, as well as on the city side. Uh, you know, just driving around roads, infrastructure, sidewalk, vehicles, all those things. Uh, and so uh, the more that we try to do in the capital program means that that debt service portion of the budget that you saw uh, in the breakdown, that's more funds that we need to uh, dedicate to debt service as opposed to kind of the, the here and now operating. And then again, the continued fiscal pressures are on the charter and school choice assessment issue. Um, if you've been following our friends in Amherst, uh, they're having a very difficult uh, budget in their school system, and one of the issues for them is the high number of students they're losing uh, to charters, and, um, and because of those, because of that, if you went back to that tax rate we looked at, and because of some of the factors about how, we, how, we, how they calculate charters, they have some of the highest charter school tuitions around. I think it's about $19,000 per student um, for a charter student leaving Amherst going anywhere. So, so they're having some, uh, some serious issues and that's gonna continue to put pressure on our budget. So this is the timeline for our budget process. Obviously this first meeting, um, January 29th, this joint meeting that we're required to have um, uh, under the charter. We've gone out to our city departments and we've also been in communication with the schools and with libraries. Um, we've asked them to do kind of a first pass budget um, and get it to us. This really isn't applied to the school department. This is more in uh, city government departments uh, by February 2nd. So we can begin, um, we be, we can begin formulating this. Uh, one positive thing, we, we all, of our, uh, all of our collective bargaining contracts are settled <coughs> for this fiscal year uh, 2016, so that gives us at least a clear understanding of what those costs will be. Um, the next uh, thing is March 3rd, again, as required by the Charter, I submit my five-year capital improvement program to City Council, um, which then you will have to have a hearing on and, and vote on. That's just a program, it's not actual spending. 
On April 2nd, um, this is a change from last year because of the administrative order, I will submit to the council proposed water and sewer rates uh, for the next fiscal year. Um, to the City Council for the City Council's approval. This is a change that we've made as part of our administrative code and, um, and shifting some of that, the power previously held by the Board of Public Works. April 15th is the deadline by which the two school districts um, must uh, vote on and, and submit their budgets to the mayor. Then on May 15th, I'm required to, pro to propose my FY 2016 uh, budget to the City Council. Uh, June 1st is that deadline, uh, as I mentioned, for the City Council to hold a public hearing and vote on the five-year capital improvement program. And then June 30th, 2000, well, 2015, I think that's, uh, it says 3,000. Um, uh, that's the, I don't even want to know what the budget will be in 3,015. Uh, the deadline for City Council to actually um, hold a public hearing and vote on the proposed FY 2016 budget. So that's kind of the timeline between now um, and the end of fiscal year 15 as we, uh, as we put together the budget for 2016. So I believe that's, that's the end of my presentation and I will um, entertain discussion or questions or um, any other uh, issues that people want to raise. Councilor Spector. Is there any projection of the continued growth We've had great growth this year for 2015, but do we have any indications of what it's going to be like um, 2016? We've asked the um, we've asked the assessor to to do. That's one of the projects she's working on right now as we um, as we try to put together the budget because we rely on her for that estimate. Um, we actually we try to be conservative in that, uh, and actually for um, for. 2015, we had estimated in that in that but in the 2015 budget um, six uh, six hundred thousand. Again, um, because we'd had seven hundred thousand, but looking historically back, we we didn't feel we could just say we're going to have another year of seven hundred thousand. So as we've come out of the recession, we've still tried to be conservative. I'd rather be under than than wildly over, and then we have to make cuts <coughs> budget. Um, to account for that. So we're going to be looking at that number. I'm, I'm still hesitant to say we're going to put 900,000 out there, um, but we may adjust that upward uh, based on. A lot of what she's going to do is look at what are the projects, you know, what building permits does Louie have out, what are other projects that are going through the planning uh, board process, uh, looking at when you know, construction might start, looking at housing starts, things like that. So those are the things we're asking her to analyze to try to give us an estimate. We have one on the side first. Oh, so okay. Suppose. Yes. Um, I know we just switched to the GIC, but if those rates come back and they're just not something we can handle, are we contractually obligated for a certain length of time to stay with them? We are. Yes, we are. Part of uh, part of being with the GIC is that you are you have a three year commitment three years. Uh, before you can move out again. Um, and there's a lot of communities and school districts uh, that have moved into the GIC. Uh, big cities, small cities, school districts, towns. Um, and so uh, this is going to be interesting. This will be interesting. So there are no guarantees on their part as far as you could opt out if it were something completely unforeseen? No, when you, when you go into it, you accept the fact that you are, you are committing yourself to, to a three-year commitment okay. as part of the, as part of the um, health insurance reform law. So, uh, so we'll have to see. Okay. Um, again, you know, keeping in mind the rates may go up higher than they've gone up. Um, but when we were when we were looking at going into the GIC, we were facing you know seven, eight, nine, ten percent increases when we shopped around for rates um, outside the GIC. So we saved significantly these last two years. Um, and again, we still you know one of the benefits of the GIC is that you have the buying power of the state and all of these city employees, state and municipal employees. Um, so we're hopeful that uh, the, the, the budget issues can be, we, we hope, can be worked out um, by the administration and through, you know, revenue adjustments and, and we hope that, but what we're also mostly concerned about is with all the Affordable Care Act changes, all the other activity happening, what that might do to rates. Um, but they're supposed to be turning all their quotes into the GIC. The GIC has a public hearing uh, that's required 
in February, and then they take a vote on all those rates. Last year, the average of all the plans, um, I think it was like a 0% increase on average. Uh, and so, um, and again, they've tended to keep their rates increases very much lower than, than the um, uh, commercial, or not commercial, but the non-GIC plans. So we'll have to see. I'll, I'll report back to you. I've had a few people, my HR director, saying we should get out of there, but we, we can't. Uh, we can't. Uh, unless there's some, uh, there'd have to be some change in the in the law, but I don't really want to get that far down the road yet. Um, so, yes. So you had one slide that showed the um, expected <coughs> state aid increase for Northampton Public Schools and Smith Vocational, and it didn't have a uh, percentage rate attached to it. But I'm just wondering. I know there are other sources that factor into whether or not there are COLA increases, and and I guess um. My question is, I, I can't recall whether we are midterm in our negotiated contracts with the Teachers Association. Yeah, closed contract. So, so, so whatever ne what we're expecting that whatever we've negotiated for the upcoming, is, is it a three? It's a three-year. It's a five-year contract. Is it just this one or three? I believe we're coming to the end of a three-year. Okay, so the, anything will still be. So, yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. So, so we're still, so that will all factor into whatever negotiations yes. then will go on in the spring. Um, for the you need a new contract for, you need a new contract. No, we have a contract in place for 2016. Okay, and do we yes. expect then that those revenues coming from the state and what other, other sources will help us meet those our, obligations? That, that, is our, that is always okay. our goal, yes. Very good. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. With regards to the foundation budget, mm -hmm. I thought um, at the hearing at the high school, I thought you did an excellent job um, representing the challenges we face with regards to the foundation budget. And I guess I wanted to ask you if you had the ability to read any tea leaves about potential changes that might actually, in reality, happen. Um, and if any changes do occur, do you envision any possibility that any might affect Northampton? Or are we really planning pretty solid, solidly on only that $25 per pupil increase? And that's pretty much what we can expect. Yeah, I, I, you know, this committee is held, is holding its hearings. They've still got more hearings to hold. I think they, I forgot when their deadline is to submit their recommendations um, to the governor and to the, to the legislature. Um, uh, I'm glad they're doing it. I'm glad they're going through the exercise. I think the challenge will be, and you know, I thought, and the superintendent, um, <coughs> the testimony, I, I, I encourage people to read it. Really, when you look at the, co the, the exponential increase in costs for things like special education, for health insurance, for all these things that have not been accounted for in the foundation budget, um, we can all agree, and I'm sure even the people on the panel can agree. The problem is it's an incredible financial, um, it would be a major financial lift to get to actually raise that foundation budget because then the state would have to, um, you know, because the way that the way foundation works is that, you know, the, the state has an obligation to, to pay a certain amount in Chapter 70 uh, to, get, to get communities to, to foundation under ED reform. Um, so. I think that's probably why there's been an aversion to revisiting these um, these the foundation budget <coughs> the formulas. Right. It's going to take more money. Is going to be the problem. And, and as we get to the larger questions about revenue right. and our and our tax system here in Massachusetts and how do you generate revenue? Um, part of what's part of what's causing this mid-year budget deficit is the fact that our um, income tax has gone down uh, this year. Um, so the income tax has actually gone down. So, uh, so that's one of the facts. So anyway, that that's so I, I'm I hope it will expose this and really lay it out there for people to understand because I know a lot of communities has been have been screaming about it and asking for somebody to look at it. I'm glad the legislature finally said, okay, as part of last year's budget, we'll form this commission, give us some recommendations. Um, but I I don't think it it I don't know that anything will be happening certainly in FY 2016 that we can count on. Right, and the irony, just as a follow-up, is you know the income tax goes down automatically, but no longer will the gas tax be indexed um, yes. in a logical mm -hmm. way that would help the city, yeah. so well, or the state, for that. 
to his credit, uh, Governor Baker did appoint a, a very progressive transportation leader who actually supported the financing <coughs> uh, uh, of the gas tax, but that Governor. voters decided that wasn't the case. So that's going to be another challenge. Yeah. Um, uh, Council President. Uh, just as a follow up. The, the, the message that I got or the caveat that I got from the, the Foundation Review Committee was essentially that while they understand the, the impact of charter schools and the charter school funding um, formula, they were saying that that's not, that was not their charge to yes. consider charter schools mm -hmm. and its impacts on the, on, on the funding formula, which, and, and I think both you and the superintendent made a great case and actually Julie Spencer Robinson did as well, and in fact, actually, all the people who spoke in, te in testimony that re referred to the fact that it's hard to ignore, given the, the extent of the impact on us, mm -hmm. and given the context in which they consider us. But I didn't walk away feeling too hopeful about the yeah. prospects of being adjusted, particularly in our, and I think our special case, and I think uh, that was the argument. We actually are somewhat of, of, of an anomaly in the structure. Yeah. And I, I don't, I didn't get an optimistic sense that there was going to be any relief from that. No. It was, and it was also, it, it was also, I thought the nice thing was that you really got a full spectrum of communities right. and how the, and the foundation budget, how it impacts d communities differently. You know, Springfields and the Holyoaks who have so many challenges that they need to try to fund um, and being funded at foundation budget, I mean, you know, we're we're above foundation budget in this district. We're spending above foundation budget, which you're allowed to do, and we're still having all kinds of challenges. And you know, some of the some of the communities across the state are like getting to foundation budget and feeling like, yeah, we, you know, we're spending at foundation budget. Built down we too. Know is yeah. is way out of date. And then you've got these smaller, little small districts like you know, when I went to Mohawk, where you know they lose like two or three kids and their enrollment drops and then they lose all this funding and they're like where do we cut like you know where do we cut um, we've got a set number of schools we've got the largest geographic area that we have to bus kids around and there's like nowhere to find savings um, so anyway it's a, it's a, it's it's a problem yeah i think i saw another hand here oh um, <coughs> Councilor Klein just wanted to um, ask for some clarification. You said that even with the addition of the new Stormwater Enterprise Fund, the net revenue from enterprise funds has gone down. Indirect, um, the indirect, uh, the indirect charges back to the city. Um, so these are for the things very much similar to the indirect charges um, or on the school side. Yeah. I mean, the biggest cause of that drop would be the closure of the landfill. Um, which happened a couple of years ago because that was generating significant. I don't. I can try to go back to the slide, but the landfill used to represent a huge portion of indirect costs back to the city, um, including a host fee and some other things. So the decline really began once the land, the solid waste enterprise fund shrunk so precipitously. Um, but then, in this last fiscal year, we reevaluated all of our. Um, you know all of our indirect charges, uh, and that actually lowered them as well. So, uh, so that's so it's it's not that the indirect not that the enterprise funds are generating less revenue. It just means what's coming over to the city as an indirect revenue has gone down. Other questions or or comments, Mr. Meyer. I know that you mentioned um, electricity rates and that the city is going forward with a solar generation project at the landfill, and I'm wondering about what kind of capital requirements they're going to be for that build out mm -hmm. um, and also what kind of impact that would have going forward and um, what percentage of the city's municipal use of electricity might be generated by that yeah so we are um, we're in the early stages of that we are in the process right now of um, of working on an RFQ uh, uh, to, to find we've actually hired a consultant um, using a grant that we received and uh, we are in the process of developing uh, RF, an RFP. We're actually looking at not only the landfill, but we're looking at a, a number of solar opportunities around the city, including parking lots, including at some of our, our police and fire stations. Um, and the goal is to try to bundle all that together. We would 
we would actually, the capital cost, there'd be no capital cost to the city because what we, typically the way these municipal agreements work is you're actually leasing out to a, to a, a private company to actually do the install, to pay for all the capital, and then you're going to realize, um, what the city would realize would be either lower rates or uh, some other form of arrangement. Because um, cities and towns aren't eligible for the tax breaks that are associated with it, um, non and, and nonprofits either. So typically, like Smith College or, or municipalities will go out and lease their roofs or do that. So um, we've been looking at that. Uh, it, it does have the potential to, to um, you know, to to cover. I'm just talking about municipal, not the city, but you know, a significant up to 50 percent of our municipal costs. Just looking at what we're specking at what size arrays could be, um, and that's that's comparable to some of our neighbors. Greenfield um, that opened an array on their landfill has has uh, seen a significant drop in their municipal energy uh, costs. So so that's coming. That's on the horizon. It's going to take a while. I mean, we we um, literally uh, less than 30 days ago, I signed the certificate that had to go to DEP saying the landfill is officially closed. Um, because we had to do all the capping and we had to do all the other site work. Um, so now we are eligible to have someone come in and do an analysis of, of how much they can actually, what, how many uh, you know, megawatt uh, array they could put on it. So, um, so more details to come on that, but we, have, we are working with a consultant and we will be putting out an RFP soon. And some of those numbers will become clearer once we start to get proposals from from companies, because that's kind of what you negotiate is uh, is what the rates will be and what the rate savings will be. But that definitely has a has the ability to hopefully offset these potential increases. I don't think it'll be by October two, 2015, but it's but it's you know it's it's not that far off. So. Oh, no, we'll set, we'll set. Thank you. Councilor, can, can, uh, what's what's the status of our agreement, the aggregation agreement that we had with the Hampshire Council of Government, that, that um, it's sort of uh, it's in it's in uh, limbo? somewhat in limbo okay. because the Department of Public Utilities has been having a, lots of issues and legal issues going back and forth. I just kind of follow the email tennis going back and forth between uh, the Cog and, and them. And there's some issues um, with it, so it has not been finalized. Um, so that has not yet happened. Uh, we're waiting to. I, uh, yeah, it is not just us. It's it's all the other communities that signed on board uh, to do that. Um, I could try to get a clearer update from the Cog for you. Um, they could give you a better update. But I, I know that it's been bogged down in a lot of back and forth, attorneys for the COG, attorneys for DPU, um, going back and forth about the, um, the aggregation agreements and how they, how they fit into state laws and regulations and things like that. Because built into that was a, a significant savings with exactly. a, a, aggregate purchasing for, exactly. for the city, and yeah. plus savings that could be folded back into further savings, investment in, in, in additional savings and in, in energy retrofits for the exactly. city. So. Exactly, yep. So uh, it's disappointing that that hasn't moved faster than we thought uh, when we adopted the, you know, the, at least our portion of it. So, Councilor? Yeah, I just had a, a similar question, um, and, and the Council President posed most of it. But just to clarify, the city itself would be eligible for um, reduced rates under municipal aggregation, or is it just for the residents? There's nothing that would prevent us as, as I, yeah I mean it would be it would be the, the whole of the city and I, I suppose theoretically the city they are one of the vendors that that quote us electricity um, so it's possible we could we could choose them as a vendor um, today we haven't but they it is possible okay. but it really it, it's going to help the larger community uh, I think that's what you're clarifying yeah yep Counselor, as we saw, um, post-employment benefits impact the budget, and and um, and I think it was last year that there was a post-employment benefits trust statute that failed in the legislature, but 
um, some communities have them. Yes. They are created by special act or um, or some other mechanism. Yep. Do, have we considered doing something like that? We did. We did it. We we um, we created one in the last uh, budget. Um, that was one of the pieces of the last uh, of the of the current budget. Um, we did create an OPEB trust fund. Um, it's at this point only uh, 200. Yeah. We put an initial investment of 100,000 into it this year. Um, our trust fund committee, uh, uh, which also provides advice to the treasurer on a number of other trust funds that we have in the city, has been working with an investment advisor to look at how best to invest that. Um, it's not quite at the level yet that we're allowed to move into, um, what's that? Private. The state's uh, pension um, investment um, uh, arm. Uh, but so we have, um, and that was one of the pieces that came out in our bond ratings, uh, this issue of OPEB um, and looking at whether or not cities and towns are beginning to uh, make a commitment to, uh, to creating a fund like this. So we have already established one. And our goal is to every year begin allocating a certain amount of money. Obviously, we'll, um, our OPEB liability, uh, it's $113 million. So uh, to, to, to fully fund our OPEB liability, we'd have to put $113 million in an account. Um, you know, obviously, our total budget is not that much in a year. So um, and we have not, we have never uh, been unable to pay for any of our retirees' benefits. We, we pay as we go. This is more of an accounting method that um, the general, uh, what is it, government accounting standards board uh, wants, um, you know, wants governments at all levels to show this liability on their books because it is a liability. It is, you know, you've committed to paying somebody's health insurance out into the future. And so if they're looking at your, your bond rating or they're looking at your, you know, whether you're credit worthy, that should be disclosed that you've got these uh, liabilities and obligations. So that's what really what OPEB and these OPEB trust funds are all about. Um, it's everything beyond retirement, which is for us is largely health insurance, the health insurance that we guarantee to, um, you know, our vested uh, retirees. So. So we are we have opened a fund and we um, are we're we're hoping to to try to um, build it up over time. I, um, also, I spoke with the finance director at the Massachusetts Municipal Conference and and she told me I believe this is accurate that um, our investments have outpaced print returns. Anyhow, they have. Yeah, I think our our system has been one of the top performing systems. So um, and we've done better than print. So uh, and. Yeah, so it's it's something we'll continue to look at, and uh, and we'll see. It's a it's a big um, it's a big lift to try to to try. There's not many communities in Massachusetts that have built significant OPEB funds at this point, um, but a lot. But most of them are trying to start them so they can again show that they're they're making a commitment to that. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Um, uh, I guess hearing none, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. To adjourn. Second. Okay. There's uh, been a motion made and seconded. All those in favor of adjourning, say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. It's a special joint meeting. The City Council and School Committee is adjourned. Okay.